أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. And among his signs is the creations of the heavens and earth, and the differences of your languages and colors. Surely, in this there are signs for the person who having knowledge. O mankind, indeed, we have created you for male and female, and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noblest of you, in the sight of Allah. Is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and aware. And when we look at these particular ayats, we have to recognize that Islam is not just for one type of people. It's not just for one type of people. Although the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an Arab, the prophets, there were, were prophets between the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Prophet Adam, and the Prophet Muhammad. You know, there were thousands of prophets that came. Some prophets had no followers. Some prophets had, you know, a few followers. Some prophets had many followers. But they were of all races. And so one of the critiques that people who try to avoid commitment to Islam, they have, oh, that's an Arab religion. No. The prophet, peace be upon him, was a prophet for all of mankind. And that's what we have to recognize, that, you know, although the prophet Muhammad was an Arab, the Arabs don't have a monopoly on Islam, and that's what we have to understand. They don't have a monopoly on this deen. Islam is for all of mankind, and we have to, again, recognize and believe sincerely before we're able to take this message to other people. Islam is for everyone. Allah says that the, the best of you are the most righteous. The best of you are the most righteous, not the most black or the most white or the most brown. The best of you are the most righteous. It's about your deeds what you bring forth. You know, all throughout the planet, for instance, there's been a, a rise of uh, a new type of racism, a new type of racism. And, you know, there's a label for it, neo-racism, neo-racism, and the new racism. And there's a, a, a philosopher, uh, Etienne um, Balibar, he has a term, and again, he, he's coined that term. He says it's racism without race. And it emerged in the 1970s. For those of you who are old enough to even remember um, the starting of the undoing of some of the civil rights legislation, the Baki decision, when a man who uh, basically said that he was denied admission to medical school because he was white and a person of color got the position, got the position in medical school. So he, they used that to take it to the Supreme Court to start undoing many of the gains of the 1960s. That started way back when. It just didn't start with Trump. It was, it, it, was, it was something that started way back then. Even, even before the Civil Rights Act was signed, they were looking at ways to undo some of the gains that people of African descent at that time and people of Spanish descent and people who were here were gaining. They were, they were looking for ways to undo it. He says it's called the racism without race, whereas racism used, used to be premised on the idea of race as a biological heredity now, in the post-colonial era, it tends to be focused on cultural differences. It surfaces in debates about immigration, assimilation, and multiculturalism. And although its tone tends to be respectful, it always is intended to preserve the pillars of racial segregation, both ideologically and practically. In other words, they want to just maintain the whole concept of white is right, white is superior some white people. And so and that's what we're basically, we're, 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 we're fighting against, brothers and sisters, this whole concept of neo-racism, neo-racism, neo new racism, racism without saying, oh, I'm not a racist. No, you say, you don't say I'm not a racist, you say I'm anti-racist, you know, and, and that takes a whole nother term. You know, again, we have to be of those to deliver Islam in its entirety and not for instance, that's foc focusing on the external, the dress, and the foods that we eat. And so Islam talks about the importance of people getting along, people of various races, people of various tribes, people of various religions. You know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he dealt with everybody. If you look in Medina, there were several people. There were Muslims. There were not yet Muslims as well as Jewish people, Christians in Medina. 
he dealt with all of them. And so we have to be of those, we live in a pluralistic society where we have so many different people. We have to be able to deal with people on different levels. They may not come to Islam, but they need to learn to respect Islam. One of the, um, the, the, the research that came out, this is around 1998, 1999, the Pew um, Institute did a study on people's perception of Islam people's perception on Islam. And so around that time, there was a positive perception in the United States about Islam. This is about, again, the late 1990s. And then after 911, they did a similar study in where 75 to 85 percent of, of Americans had a positive uh, view of Islam. It went down, way down into the 50s for the most part because of 911. And so for the last 20 years, we've been trying to work to get back that image that we had prior to 911. And it just recognized the whole anniversary of uh, the 20th anniversary of the, that, that incident. So we have to recognize that people have a negative impression of Islam. And so it's not about us basically going around just, uh, you know, just trying to placate them. But basically, we have to, first of all, internalize our deen so that we can externalize our deen. You know, Islam is the medicine for this sick society. Islam is the medicine for the, the, the racism in the society. Islam is the medicine for the violence in the society. Islam is the medicine for the poverty in the society and the, the political corruption in the society. Islam is a cure for the ills of the society. We have to recognize that we have the medicine. We have the medicine and we're holding on to it. Imagine if all the pharmacies in the country shut down. People would die. But we have the pharmacies called the, called the masjids. The, we have the masjids all around the country. And we're not giving the people the medicine. We're not giving the people the medicine. You know, we can you know, walk around, again, looking like a Muslim, but we have to live as we are Muslims. And we are the healers. Allah put us here for a reason. Allah put us here for a reason. And as, as he's, you know, people were asked, well, why are we here? We're here to worship Allah. But we're also here to propagate. We're also here to, to bring this message to the people. We have to let the people know that the beauty of Islam and help them away from dysfunctional lifestyles, the lifestyles of being dependent on drugs and alcohol, being dependent on overeating, being dependent on you know, sexing you know, all over the place, being dependent on basically developing unethical lifestyles that's inconsistent with the lifestyle that the, the Muslim is supposed to live. I was interviewed by a reporter earlier this week, and he asked uh, the question of what was my attraction to the community when I moved down from Philadelphia. And I, and I told him, well, I came down here for a week in 1979. And when I came here the first day, I called back to my then fiance and my mother. I said, well, I ain't coming back. And he, he, he was dumbfounded. And I said, what I observed there were people living around the masjid. They were living communally. You know, I saw men interacting with their families, treating their wives with respect. You know, I saw people trying to basically externalize the Islam and internalize the Islam, practicing what they preach. I remember one time, in, you know, there were times where people who were, uh, people were, would get into domestic violence in, in the neighborhood and the women were running to the store. You seek protection of the imam and whoever was working in the store at that time. You know, they would run for help because they recognized that the Muslims brought a certain amount of peace in this society because this was in the middle of the crack epidemic in this, in this country. But we were able to carve out a peaceful coexistence with the people that they knew that don't bring that here. Don't bring that here. And so alhamdulillah, our children, you know, although they moved on when they go to different places, they go, they seek out community wherever they go. And that's how it's supposed to be. Not saying they have to stay here with us, but seek out community wherever you go, wherever you are. And we need to establish community. We need to not only reestablish what we had, you know, right now, you know, this, this place has gone to the gens. It's gentrified. You know, so we have to recognize that we lost an opportunity. Well, houses were going for ten, fifteen thousand dollars at one time. Now they're going for no less than two or three hundred thousand now. You know, but it doesn't mean that you can't take the, the spirit of the community wherever you are and wherever you may be. 
And so I, I shared with him, that's what I saw. I saw men involved with their families. And again, witnessed how marriage was valued. And, and, and what we have to understand in order to have a more stable society, we have to stabilize ourselves. As Allah says, he does not change the condition of people until they change what is in their hearts. He does not change the condition of people until they change what is in their hearts. So we have to detox from the ignorance of the society. All things in the society are not evil and bad. But there are certain things that can pull you away from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslims need to stay away from the drugs and alcohol, whether it's using it or selling it. Muslims need to get out of the gang mentality. Get out of the gang mentality. Get away from that and just come to the community. Develop a community mentality. You know, we have to get away from the violence. We have to be of those who work to stop the violence. We have a brother in Ohio, uh, he along with Imam Jamil and others around the country organized to have the, some of the largest gangs in the country where they put peace treaties together. We have to do that type of work, brothers and sisters. We have Muslims in politics. We have Muslims involved in, in society. We have Muslims who are involved in activism. But as a Muslim, we need to be radioactive, as the, the broadcaster says. We need to be radioactive, be involved. We look at the Muslims of the past. We, you know, we, 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 we relish uh, the, the, the accomplishment of people like Malcolm X, Al-Hajj, Malik Al-Shabazz, and, and, and also uh, Muhammad Ali. We, look, we, we, will, we will relish in the, their accomplishments. But they did the work during that time. And they did work without the internet, without millions of followers. You know, they did the work, you know, without Twitter or, or Facebook or anything. They would travel and throughout this, the country and throughout the world to try to basically bring about a different understanding of how we should live together as human beings. So we have to do that. We, we got lazy. You know, we become keyboard jihadists. You know, I'll show you, I'll send you a tweet. So we have to basically do more legwork verbalize and actualize, brothers and sisters. If we want a stable society, we can't just live in a Muslim bubble. And we can't just live in a Muslim bubble. If we're gonna be here, we need to be here. And when things start to happen, we can't say, you know, oh, that's them people. You know, we have to do something to help make significant changes in the society. We're the healers, we're the healers. And, you know, and, and again, we have to be of working with people who are of other faiths as well. We have to do interfaith work if it's about stopping the violence, if it's about stopping the drug trade, it's about stopping all sorts of corruption in the society. We can work with other people. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he worked with other people. You know, so we have to do that. You know, we have, you know, more in common with them than not. For Allah says, and do not dispute with the followers of the book, except those of them who act unjustly and say, we believe in that which was, has been revealed to us and revealed to you. And our, our, our God and your God is one. And to him do we submit. You know, we accept Jesus, peace be upon him, as the prophet of Allah, not as the son of God. You know, we accept Moses, alayhi salam. We accept Abraham, alayhi salam. We accept all of the prophets that they talk about. And so we have to understand that we have work to do. We cannot allow the neo-racism to take root and spread like a disease. There was one politician, he said that he wanted to um, take the society back to 1950s, to 19, I think he said like 1951. You know, that's way before Brown versus the Board of Education. So just like the people of our parents' generation did work, we have to start doing work, brothers and sisters. And not just riding on the, the, the coattails of the, the, the heroes that we have. The heroes that we have. We, we have to say, okay, what would they be doing in this times? What would they be doing about the violence? What would they be doing about the drugs in, in the community, in the society? What would they be doing about the corruption in politics? What would they be doing about the poverty? So we have to start doing the work, brothers and sisters. And again, dealing with other people you know, you know, we don't have to uh, compromise our beliefs. You know, we have to be involved in the anti-racist movement. We have to be involved in making, again, the society something that our children and our families 
can be safe in. This is the work that we have to do. Islam is not about just, you know, praying. You know, Imam had a quip where he would say, the prophet, peace be upon him, didn't pray all day and he didn't play all day. You know, and so we have to be of those, after we leave, we get filled up at the masjid, we get filled up at Juma. It's like filling up your, your, your car at the gas station, you get full, and then you drive, and you use that as fuel, spiritual fuel, to be able to effectuate a change in the overall society. And if I've said anything that's inconsistent with what Allah has given us and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches, teaches us, I take full responsibility for that. And if I've said anything in which you have gained some new insight, as always, all praise is due to Allah. La ilaha illallah wahduhu la sharika la lahu muk lahu ham wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and females and made you peoples or colors and tribes that you may get to know one another. Indeed, the most noblest of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. And again, as Allah says, that the best of you are who most righteous. The best of you are he who is most righteous. So again, we can interact. And interacting don't mean that we have to assimilate into dysfunctional lifestyles. You know, if we're participating in a demonstration, we just break ranks and make prayer. You know, and hear that Allahu Akbar. You know, Allah knows best. Uh, you know, we, at times when we would go to different events and we would make prayer and there were people who would come to Islam based on the fact that they see the Muslims trying to effectuate a change in the society, but also they're making sure that they're tapping into their, their fuel source, the prayer. You know, and so, you know, again, Islam is not just about being passive. We have to be active. As Allah says, you know, the, O oh, you who believe, be persistent in standing firm for Allah. Witness injustice, and do not let the hatred of people prevent you from being just. Be just, that is near to righteousness, and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is fully aware of what you do, fully aware of what you do. You know, again, you know, people learn more by what they see than what you say. What they see, and in fact, some psychologists say that people learn 80% for more or more from their vision. And so we have to be active out in the world, but also be assertive in our deen and not hiding our deen. The best of you who are when seen remind of Allah. And so that could be in your dress, or that can be in the ethics that you are promoting, or the nor that you emit. You know, I remember seeing a man, he was dressed up in a suit, and I gave him salams. He said, well, how did you know I was a Muslim? So he was incognito. You know, and I said, I saw the Noah, brother. He just laughed and smiled. You know, so I'm saying the thing is, you know, just you don't have to wear a thole or things like all that all the time. You can basically dress your heart up, internalize this dean in your heart, and it will effectuate a change in you. And then it will effectuate a change in the people around you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that your dean is on your friends. What are your friends doing? What are your closest associates doing? That's your dean. That's your dean. And if your closest associates are not calling you to write, calling you to Islam, then you have to change your associates. You have to change your associates if you want to become a believer. You know, we can all be Muslims, but not all of us can be believers. When we deal with people, we have to be fair and don't take advantage of them. As Allah says, be fair in weight and measurement. We have to be serious about our faith, brothers and sisters, because, again, we're working for a larger goal. We're working for, you know, a larger goal. We're working for Jannah. We're working for paradise. And we have to be real models and not role models. Real models, not role models. A real model, you know, I remember seeing the movie uh, Lying of the Desert, and there was uh, based on a real character, a real person, Sheikh Umar Mukhtar. And there's a scene in there that's, that stuck out. Stuck, sticks to my mind even to this day. And when he was dealing with uh, the Italian fascists, uh, they, had some, they took some prisoners. And he said, we don't kill prisoners. We do not kill prisoners. 
and he said, uh, this is after protecting two Italian fascist prisoners. And then one of his soldiers said, they do it to us. And Umar Mukhtar responded with the famous words, they are not our teachers. You know, and so we learn from the Quran, we learn from the Sunnah, we learn from the Prophet Muhammad, and, we, and these are ethics. And a lot of the people who write books on ethics, they use Islam as a means of establishing their books. They take from Islam, but they don't give credit. Freud took from Islam, he don't give it credit. All the philosophers, they take from Islam, but they don't give it credit. You know, so we have to basically start to collect. You know, let us, let us teach that Islam, again, is not just about basically dressing a certain way. It's about, again, turning, the, turning the, your self into a different person and turning your society into, into a different society. We have to fight the neo racism, the new racism. Imam Jamil, he has said in the 1980s in the Qutbah, he said, racism is America's AIDS. Racism is America's AIDS. He, saw, he foresaw you know, the present state of this country right now, many years ago. You know, he saw racism as a disease. You know, the truth is that you know, his generation forced America into concessions. When you look at Kwame Ture, who used to be Sokli Carmichael, and Imam Jamil when he was H. Rap Brown, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, their generation forced, forced this society into making concessions. And so they made external concessions, but they, their hearts weren't changed. Their hearts weren't changed. Now it's time for us to do the heart surgery in this society. Because if we don't do it, that neo-colonialism, that neo-racism will take root. Will take root. And in the Zelhaj Malik al-Shabazz, in his last speech, a week before he was killed, a week before he was killed, he had a famous quote. He said, they know how to put something so that you'll sympathize with it, and they know how to put something so that you'll be against it. I'm telling you, they're masters at it. And if you don't develop the analytical ability to read between the lines and what they're saying, I'm telling you again, they'll be building gas ovens. And before you wake up, you'll be in one of them, just like the Jews ended up in the gas ovens over there in Germany. You're in a society that's just as capable of building gas ovens for black people as Hitler's society was, as Hitler's society was. He said this right a week before he was killed because he knew that, you know, again, they forced the society to accommodate black people during that time, but they knew, what, they knew that it wasn't in most white people's heart. The majority of the population has not internalized the concept that people who are different from them are their cultural peers. You know, again, and when we make in prayer, we say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah is supreme. But what do they say? They say Abiyaduhu Akbar, white is supreme. White is supreme. It is their dean for some of them. It is their dean. And one of the other points that El Hajj Malik al Shabazz said in that last speech, and you just listen to it and review it, and it's, it's online. They, the whole text is online. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a lesson in basically multiculturalism and, and, and how to uh, change the society and change yourself. You know, so it's a, it's a great speech. You know. He, he, talked, you know, he talked about the importance of just people changing, the t people changing that he said that he felt that Islam could erase the racism out of the racist hearts in the society because after he came back from Hajj, he said he witnessed people who were the whitest of white, but they didn't have that racism. They didn't have that, as he said, you know, you know what it is, a free white in 21. You know, he used that, that, that verse saying that I'm superior, but he sat with them as, as peers. And so this is one of the points that we have to start to, and he was only practicing Islam for one year, less than a year. Well, less than a year, and so he was able to analyze not only this over, he was analyzing the society all the time, he was in the nation of Islam, but when he started reading the Quran, he said, oh, this is the medicine, this is the medicine. But we're reading Quran, we're memorizing the Quran, but how much are we externalizing? How much are we implementing in the overall society? How much a Quran are we implementing in our daily lives? How much? And lastly, the Prophet Sallallahu said in his last speech, all humans are descended from Adam and Eve. There is no superiority of the Arab over the non-Arab, or the non-Arab over the Arab. 
and no superiority of a white person over the black person or a black person over the white person, except on the basis of personal piety and righteousness. So let us, let us live like that. Let us give like that. Let us live like that. Let us give like that. Again, if I've said anything that's inconsistent with what Allah gives us and what the Prophet of Islam real modeled for us, I take full responsibility for that. And if I've said anything in which you have gained some new insight, as, all pray, as, as, as always, all praise is due to Allah. رَبَّنَا لَا تُعَكِدْنَا إِنَّا سَيْنَا لَقْتَنَّا رَبَّنَا وَلَا تَحْمِلَ لَيْنَا إِسْرًا كَمَا هَمَوْتُ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِنَا رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُهَمِّنَا مَا لَا تُعْقَطَ لَنَا بِهِ وَفْوَنَّا وَاكْفِلِنَا وَحَمْنَا أَنْتَ مَا لَنَا فَنْسُونَا أَهْلَ الْكَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ Our Lord, take us not to task if we forget or fall into error. Our Lord, lay not on us a burden as you did lay on those who have gone before us. Our Lord, lay not on us a burden which we do not have the power to bear and overlook our faults and forgive us. Have mercy on us. You are our protector and grant us the victory over the unbelieving people.